For me, what I've learned through the process is to manage my expectations. Because coming into this, I mean, we started, we started in concept June of 2020. We had our first event February of 2021. I thought that by June of 2021, we would have our full trailer and be on the road. And I said to myself, <laughs> I will let her have that. And we're gonna work like that's it. And for me, it was like, and I'm not gonna be surprised if that doesn't happen, but I'm gonna shoot like it will be. This is Start with Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guests are Carmen Diane and Kara Still, founders of Prosperity Market. Last year, as the world was dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and the racial reckoning spurred on by the murder of George Floyd, Carmen felt inspired to do something about it. She partnered up with Kara and the two of them set out to create a market that would feature black farmers and businesses, also while providing low-income areas of LA with access to fresh produce and healthy food. The idea was solid, but there were bumps in the road that were unforeseen, such as a difficulty in finding black farmers. The progress may not be as fast as Carmen would like, but little by little, they are making their presence known all over Los Angeles County and making a big impact in the communities they visit. So listen in as we cover everything from why they legally can't call themselves a farmer's market, how they've been able to grow largely through direct donations on their website, and why they're currently building two businesses, the one they're in now and the one they'll be in five years from now. Now, back to the episode. All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Prosperity Market. Either one of you can take this. What is Prosperity Market? All right, I'm Carmen. That's Kara. <laughs> In Prosperity Market, we're a mobile farmer's market. We feature black farmers, food producers, and chefs, and we travel all over LA. We make it easy to support black businesses while creating food access in our communities. And what, what made you guys want to start this, this whole venture? What was the first step or the idea of what you guys saw was missing in the community or just like the problem you wanted to fix? It really started during like quarantine. Mm -hmm. You know, we were at home. Carmen's thing is like she had watched all of Netflix. All of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. Except same. for Tiger King. You didn't watch Except Tiger King? I have not Tiger? watched it, mm -hmm. no. That's a whole separate You're like the only person in the U.S. at this point who it's, has not watched it. Yeah, same with Squid Game. But anyway, oh. continue. Yeah, th that's <laughs> another. Ooh. We're going to have to talk about that <laughs> after this. I mean, I don't it's watch not too much late. TV. Yeah. Like, Those I'm are two I've watched. I'm saving it. I'm yeah. saving it. <laughs> For what? Yeah, you yeah. made it through a pandemic. I, I mean, and we have less time now than we. Had. What so, variant are, are we dating? on right now? <laughs> <laughs> That's usually um, people watch these things. Yeah, is when they're dating. Maybe no, you're not, you're not no, dating. No, I'm that, not. That, okay. I, but but I am. Um, She's open single to, the, <laughs> <laughs> to all of the listeners. Here, so where's if the camera? There's a Let squid me... Game partner that she. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> She's yeah. down. There's someone out there who hasn't watched Tiger King or Squid Game. We have the perfect match. You'll you. know that that's your person. That's my person. When that should be your dating profile. Put it on the profile. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. you'll know. Okay, okay. I like how we took a left here. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's so easy. So economics that, yeah. in the black yeah, community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Carmen's so, bored yeah, during COVID. So during after that, <laughs> at the time we actually were still like, it was before they had closed Runyon, so we were still hiking mm -hmm. regularly. Mm -hmm. And um, then when all of the like, social unrest happened and all of that we were talking um reading and just kind of like looking at what we could do like how we could contribute and make a difference mm -hmm. and this was born out of that out of creating an economic impact and then saying how can we do that looking at food and then being like oh there's gaping holes in both of those things. And so we created the idea of prosperity market, really bridging, creating an economic impact and uh, really good accessible food and utilizing black farmers who have had such a limited platform to create the base for it. As you guys were starting the concept, did you learn anything interesting about like the socioeconomics of it all? In, in the sense of like, I didn't necessarily grow up in like the best affluent community or whatever, but at some point it's like you, you start to believe this narrative where, oh, people buy fast food, because it's cheaper, right? And then you see the, the like the super obvious examples of like the one dollar Big Mac, let's say, compared to like take a dollar at the grocery store and you can't buy anything. Like you're gonna buy a Snicker bar, and so there's really that. But once you go a little bit above that, fruits and vegetables kind of they can become, I guess, closer to reach 
than a lot of people think. For me, I just, I think it's a lot, in, in these communities that don't have grocery stores and they have the fast food and liquor stores and corner stores, if that's where you're shopping because that's within reach, that is more expensive than the grocery store. You're going to spend way more at the corner store than you are at the grocery store. Like, it's not that there's not money in these communities. There is. There's money there. It's just what's available to spend it on. One of the things that Diego and I did during the pandemic was we had a masterclass subscription. And one of the uh, courses on masterclass was taught by Ron Finley, who uh, is a, a gardener. And, and he, I feel like his goal is very in line with, with what your goal is in the sense of he's trying to bring fresh fruit, vegetables, uh, healthy foods to these communities where there there does exist a food desert in a sense. And when you have this space and you're able to grow it, I mean, I would assume bolsters the community in, in a, a very significant way. I mean, have you seen just in, from your time in doing Prosperity Market, have you seen a change or is it something that you are aware that it'll take a lot more time? I think it's a little bit of both. So I know like for me and for Carmen, we talk about the fact that like all of us are so disconnected from our food. And so in all of these experiences and like meeting and talking to like the farmers and the growers, like getting our own hands in the dirt, being excited about like taking things home and eating it fresh. It's something that created like a new space within us saying like, oh my gosh, like, no, I'm excited about this. This actually tastes better than anything I get from the grocery store. And then having those conversations with people that we know that also weren't doing those things. Because oftentimes the circles are so small of people who are growing things or are eating fresh or are trading with each other. So it's like expanding that and people do then get excited about it. And even to your point, Diego, when you said like, discovering like, okay, yeah, really obvious on the surface, like fast food is cheaper. Mm -hmm. But when people come to our markets, they're actually surprised at how affordable things are. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's all about margins and profits in grocery stores, which that's a whole other conversation. But, you know, the prices are what they are intentionally. It's so that people can buy the processed food versus the fresh food. And we got to see that, we got connected with that, and then we just have the opportunity to continue to expose other people to it. And there's something that happens like once you're connected to the food, once you see where it comes from or talk to the people that grow it, where you get excited about it in a new way. And I know there's certain things now that not even on purpose, I just don't want to get from the grocery store anymore because now I just know that it's not the same. Like it just doesn't taste the same. Yeah. From a business perspective, you guys are in some way are going down this road of like creating a marketplace. And so what was your first step? How did you guys reach out to these vendors? How did you vet them? How did you make sure they showed up? You know, all of that. That's a lot of hard work in getting this, your first event, let's say, off the ground. It was not easy to find black farmers, let me tell you. Like initially it was like, we're going to start a farmer's market. We're going to have black farmers. Okay. Yeah. And then it's like, wait, where are the black farmers? How many are there? There are less than 2% in the U.S., less than 2% of farmers. I think the actual number is 1.3%. We had to kind of redefine what we considered a farmer. So we started to look for urban farmers, community gardens, backyard growers. And once we kind of expanded our definition, that's when we started to find our vendors. Okay. And then what was the process like? You pitch them, you, help, you try to get them to understand your vision and what you want to do and were they about it right away? Or was there At some... first it was really just a conversation, like yeah. just us introducing ourselves and talking mm -hmm. to them about like, what they do, how long, what they grow, how it all works. And then it was really like, yeah, we're building this thing. This is our vision. And surprisingly, we had a lot of really good responses. I mean, some people were like, all right, let me see. Cause you know, I come from a fashion design background, Carmen's a makeup artist. So it's like, oh, that's good. What are you all up to? So there was a little, there was positive apprehension. So really we didn't get a lot of resistance we did actually meet with ron finley we've talked to him several times is he a nice um, guy he's an interesting guy he's a good guy That's he's a good an word interesting for guy i asked him to be on the podcast you know what he his first thing was how much are you paying me yeah. and i go hey ron so good to hear from you nothing is uh -huh. what we're paying you just come on and like we'll support you know we're here we're kind of like your hype team frankly for like a week yeah and he was like oh i see y'all are just trying to make money off the backs of us okay and I was like, wow, that's not, oh, I was like, all right, onward. We were 
actually really happy to be able to have the conversations with him that he had. And, you know, like a lot of people come to him for things, talking to him about, you know, so I think like one of the things Carmen and I talked about was I think that after he saw that we didn't kind of like give up on what we were saying and we started following through, yeah. then he started responding a little bit more and we had several conversations with him. So, okay. yeah. He so. might have even smiled once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. That's normally how, you know, you know things are going well. <laughs> what was your first event like? It was really, I don't want to say surprisingly, but it, it was like surprisingly perfect. Like, it, I wouldn't say without a hitch, but like on the day, it just felt perfect. Yeah. It was uh, It was in Hollywood, right? Where was it? Inglewood. 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 Yeah, our first okay. one, February of this year. Okay. And, you know, there were several people like, oh my gosh, this is your first event ever? Like, people had such a great time. Everybody was so excited. Everybody showed up. Like, we were like, oh my gosh, there's people like lining up waiting for us to open the gate for us. It was amazing. It, it wasn't perfect, by the way, but it, it felt That's it pretty felt cool, perfect. <laughs> but yeah, it felt yeah, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we had so much support. Yeah. Like, you know, we had people that just were willing to help us navigate putting together the entire thing, helped us to get volunteers. Mm -hmm. It set the groundwork. We had a lot of um, really strong organizations kind of partner with us and volunteer and like lead in the volunteer effort, which was this is the first event that Kara and I ever did, especially something like this. So moving forward, even when they weren't with us at the events, we, we learned from that. So we were able to still orchestrate. So I think it just really set us up for success, all the, all the rest of the markets. And financially, how much did you guys have to like put in? Was there a lot of savings on the line or was it something like it was pretty lightweight in terms of your initial investment? We invested what we had, but we didn't have a lot because we weren't working. We sure. uh, asked, <laughs> we called in a lot of favors. Lots yeah. of favors. <laughs> Still to this day. Yes. Yeah. And honestly, like we have, you know, we have the numbers written down. But really, when somebody asks, like, how are you all making this happen? Yeah. It really is honestly a miracle. Like, honestly, we every month on paper with the scale and the frequency of things we do, yeah. it shouldn't work. Yeah. And we've, we've had this conversation yeah. before so, where, where I'm like, it's a tremendous amount of work if you think about it, right? So you got all these vendors to align. You got to get them all to show up. You got to deal time. with the property owner. You got Yeah, right. They, right. There's a property owner component to it. There's, there's probably permitting. permits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to get some city permits in line. And then what seems like the easiest part is getting people to show up, which is the hardest part, right? Because you're hoping that all the marketing you guys have done is going to pay off. And that's something that you really don't know until day of. There's no way to, you know, no one's RSVPing. And if they do, you know, maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. But it's super, it's super complicated. How yeah. did you both get the word out ahead of that first market? We were really fortunate that we got an LA Times article that came out right before our first market. And that also was like set our trajectory. So we like, we were reaching out to friends, social media, emails, phone calls, texts. And then that LA Times article came out and people were like, what is this? Who is this? What's happening? So we had people show up just because of that. And they were like, I saw you in the, in the Times. I've always wondered this. So when you're on the LA Times, what was the biggest bump you guys saw? Was it like emails? Was it Instagram? What was the thing that people were all of a sudden communicating to you of like, oh, I saw you here. Where did you guys see the response? For us, it was a little bit of everything because we were new on everything. Like we had just launched our website in January. So this and the market was, was February. Yeah. yeah. So people were reaching out via social media, like our following went up and a lot of like older people like hit us up via email. That yeah. seems when you say older, that seems right. Well, no, I mean like there was a you couple like who was like, 40? no, no, no. I mean like 60s. The people that aren't on okay. Instagram. Okay. I mean like, I mean like sixties, like there Got was it. a couple and she was like, we live not far and we saw you guys in the LA times. She emailed it like, so yeah, like sixties and up were like, looking at our website and going via email and stuff like that. And so how many markets have you guys done so far this year in 2021? What month is this right now? December. December. Welcome to Did December. Did we do nine guys. market? Was it eight or nine? Nine? Nine. And what have you learned in doing them? Like, what do you guys find to be either maybe this location is better than this one? What are the things that you're starting to see around, okay, this, this is what success looks like and this is what doesn't really necessarily work? Like, are there some vendors that they don't hit and then others do. What is the thing that you guys are seeing that is, is like working? Well, the first thing before, because I know there are some specifics to speak to, the first thing is we really had to come in with kind of no expectation about what success looks like. Mm -hmm. 
So really being willing to come in and say, all right, like we're doing this and we're going to see because depending on the area. That's hard though. No expectations it, is really. Well, I mean, an expectation of like, oh, have, we, we want to do well philosophy. and we want people to I like it. I might expectations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Try yeah. not to. I do that um, all the time. Nick will say like any, any, anything I do, whether it's like a vacation or whether it's like a real estate development project, he's like, this is going to be amazing. And he's like a little kid. And I'm like, we'll see. <laughs> He's, but it's not. He's always the one to tamp it down. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm always like, up I feel here. like I'm bumming people out to some extent, but it's like, I don't know. It's, it feels safer to just have no expectation. I feel like that's it's for me. Though. What I've learned through the process is to manage my expectations mm -hmm. because coming into this, I mean, we started, we started in concept June of 2020. We had our first event February of 2021. Mm -hmm. I thought that by June of 2021, we would have our full trailer. Oh, we didn't even talk about that. But I thought we would have our full trailer and be on the road. And I said to myself, <laughs> I will let her have that. And we're gonna work like that's it. And for me, it was like, and I'm not gonna be surprised if that doesn't happen, but I'm gonna shoot like it will be. But that was just something that I kept for myself. Cause I, I, like, I really do feel like anything is possible and we could have done it. And for me, it wasn't a surprise to, for it not to be because there's, I feel like there's so many things we had to learn along the way yeah. that it's just like, yeah, that makes sense. Well, what do you guys mean by having the full trailer? So like you started with a, a I, don't, I don't even know, like a van and then you wanted to expand to a trailer as well? Or like what was the progression that you didn't reach that you thought you would? So right now we are doing, cause we're fundraising for our trailer. So we do our monthly pop-ups are um, like open air. We set up, it's, it's pop-up. So we have tents and tables. Um, we rotate our locations each month. Mm -hmm. And the goal though is to have a full trailer. I mean like a big 48 foot trailer. The back is the farmer's market. You can come in and shop and it is set up like a produce aisle in a grocery store. Um, it'll have a register, all of that. And then the front of the trailer is a kitchen. And we're actually going to rent that out to different chefs and food entrepreneurs. So it is a pop-up food truck. And it's all one trailer. It's all together. Using the ingredients from the back of the trailer for the, the kitchen? It, it could. But the really, whoever is renting out the kitchen, it's there. It could be restaurants. It could be another mm. chef. It could be. So it's it's like a pop-up food truck with our farmer's market. Yeah. Got all it. in one. But has that morphed now? Like, do you want to do something completely different than that? Or do no, you guys that's, still, still, the that's still the goal. That is still the goal. But we did not know how many pop-ups we would be doing right. before that. How so much now, is the trailer? The trailer? The yeah. total is 140000 that's a, oh, that's a lot of money. It's all custom. It's a special trailer. It's a What's very good? special. What kind of trailer very, is this? It's very, it's that, a very special. In my head, special. I had this like thing on the back of a U-Haul. Well, I was thinking like 40, it's like 50 fence grand. material. No, it's we'll a show whole, you off air. Yeah. 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 It's a whole thing, a very wow. custom situation. And with the kitchen? Yeah, with the kitchen. Okay. So the thing, I think, well, one of the things that's now something that we didn't anticipate before is even once we have that, we're still going to do our once a month pop-ups. So that wasn't necessarily something we had even factored in at first, yeah. but it still will allow us to like have the experience and be more expansive and include more vendors and stuff like that. So when I talk to them, I always geek out about as a real estate developer on like the future, the implications of what you guys are doing. And so to some extent in a post pandemic world, you have to be outside, you have to be open air. And I think if you were to go all the way back, like I grew up or I was born in Peru. So if you go back to Peru today, let's say there's like markets, there's outdoor markets, right? Some of these are in the United States also, you see them less and less, but it's like going back actually to this concept of this outdoor market. In Houston, Texas, we were about to build a distillery there. That project died, but across the street, or like right around it, they're building this farmer's market. And it's this huge butcher building. So just think of like a massive, massive building, bigger than a grocery store, but all outdoor, all open air. And it's like rows of kind of what you're saying. So think about maybe trailers times eight, maybe times 10. And then in the middle is like the food court, kind of what you guys are describing too, where there's like ice cream and there's like different chefs. And it's just like beautiful farmer's market that is almost open all the time. Dude, what's it called? It's called the Houston's Farmer's Market. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we got like literally, sure literally. Okay. Yeah, but it's this like cool idea. Things. And so as you guys, you know, the reason I'm just giving, I guess, the listeners a, a sense of like why I geek out and talking to you because it, you're at the cutting edge of something that I think will be really interesting to how people buy groceries in the future. Not so much, well, also from an education perspective, but also from like a very literal, literal like what does it mean to be in to grocery shop? Yeah. Like I think that, that it'll have a new meaning in our lifetime 
And I think you guys are like building that, which is really cool because it's also morphing. Yeah. Right. And I think like that's why I always just get excited. Thank you. Because we get excited, too, because like we have a whole lot of things up our sleeve that we want to do are growing into still being really flexible with like our vision of what that looks like and like sometimes just like managing our own excitement with like oh my gosh like this is what it's gonna be is this the first time you guys are fundraising yes yeah yes we've been fundraising like we've done this all ourselves so we've been fundraising since the beginning of our but we you know like people donate like right on like and contribute right on our website. Okay. So we created this ourselves. So it's all okay. been very much like grassroots reaching out, spreading the word. And how are you guys fundraising for the, the 140, 50,000 for the trailer? We've been, um, I would call it like soft crowdfunding. So on our website, um, you know, we have a page set up where people can go and they can contribute. Tell me website, tell me website. Prosperitymarketla.com. <laughs> So um, you can contribute on our website, and we are planning for a proper crowdfund next year. Okay. And when you say proper crowdfund, is that still on your website, or will you will you be doing it with like GoFundMe or We're going to do it with uh, Fun Black Founders. Okay. We were like very lucky to win uh, a grant from JLH, Drew and Lauren Holiday, and so as part of that, they set us up with uh, Crowdfund Better and Fun Black Founders as support and teaching for how to really build a crowdfund. What has that been like in terms of like support, mentorship? Yeah, what what's, what's the program? Oh my gosh, it's been amazing. One, some of the things that we've learned have just directly impacted our business, not even just about crowdfunding, but just really seeing how important it is to be intentional with reaching out and communicating with people. You know, what we do, like the markets are open to everyone. We talk to people, everybody's invited, but even the difference that it made for us to reach out individually to people to tell them about the market. Yeah. Like a lot of people came for the first time once we started doing that. And so even something just that small has opened up what we're doing to people to be like, mm -hmm. And oh. these are people who are on our Instagram and on our email list. So Some they of them know. we know personally too. <laughs> They're like our me. friends. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so something like that has been great. And they have a curriculum. They do this. It's what they do. So it's, really taken the guesswork out of it but it's also revealed like just how much work there is behind setting up a successful crowdfund like it's not just slap it together and there are steps it is very intentional so it is true. very created so true and making sure that like people are aware before you're like hey press go i need money so it's a process and it's at times been a lot because we were doing the training I think along it's like with our markets. Company. I it think is. it's like starting a different company. You're absolutely right. For like a boot camp type type period, like eight, yeah. eight to twelve weeks. And the thing and you asked how supported we feel, I mean, incredibly supported. Because first of all, the training was supposed to be three months and it's just like indefinitely at this point. <laughs> <laughs> we just meet every Tuesday and it's great. And we can call them or email, you know, we can contact them with any questions, like not even crowdfund specific. We actually paused our crowdfund because most of our cohort went live um, in October. And we, I mean, this was in the midst of, we were doing our scavenger hunt, the black business scavenger hunt. We were planning markets. We had so much going on with ourselves that we couldn't even put that energy into planning a crowdfund properly. And they understood and they, you know, take your time and now we're gonna revamp and come at the top of the year. Yeah. And they were just really supportive of that. They were like, hey, you know, if you all have the foresight and the courage, even within this cohort situation to say, hey, like we want to be able to to properly do this and that's not the right time. They yeah. were amazing about it. Do they give you any help uh, as, it, as it relates to like the content, like content strategy, content creation? Absolutely. All that. Really. Yeah. And just helping us like with everyone, like making sure that you refine your brand voice and what you want to communicate and how to do that. So um, they're amazing. And any resources that we don't have, then they connect us with people to help. When do you think it'll go live? February. February. And is it equity or is it just like a... This is rewards-based. Okay. Yeah. So different tiers, people get some cool stuff. Absolutely. What's the biggest tier you guys are going to do? We are still working all yeah, of we're, that out. We're finding that. <laughs> I'm always curious when I ask people this because it's like, um, you don't want to go too big. You know, you want to make it approachable. Absolutely. But at the same time, like what you're giving away is, is pretty dope right yeah. for that one tier and yeah, so absolutely it's like how good is it 
how much money are you, you know. Yeah, it's, so it's th a, those are actually details that like we you're, started you're looking out. at before, but now we're going back and looking to see like what makes sense. And do you have a magic number that you're trying to hit in your heads? Oh yeah. 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 That's a tricky, that's always a tricky question for me, especially when it comes to a crowd fund, because you know, our trailer is $140,000 and we, I mean, f from the beginning, that's the number that we've been trying to go towards. Mm -hmm. And we've been chugging along. So I think there needs to be some revisiting of what that looks like as it pertains to like crowdfunding. And we're, we're still pursuing other funding sources. And I just want to take a moment to say like, we have been able to put money down on that trailer and that's strictly through our website and people wanting to support us. So that's been really exciting. So it's on hold. It's, it's no, it's, oh, in, yeah, process. it's in progress. It's in yeah. progress. Yeah. Like, because people have like, come to our markets or seen us and wanted to support like so strictly yeah. through like soft crowdfunding word of mouth we've been able to actually like put a chunk down on our trailer yeah. and that's exciting so wait when it comes to this fundraising how much will you guys think to to raise well that's what we're looking at now so it's like now it's got to go beyond the trailer right we're well, yeah 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 what's what else is out there that there, you guys want to tackle Outside of the trailer, I mean, we need we need a commercial kitchen just to operate the trailer, you know, a commissary where we park the trailer, our monthly operational expenses. Like, these are all funding that we're going to need beyond just the actual physical trailer. Yeah, your operations, yeah, all that, yeah. Exactly. And then, you know, monthly costs when we do the pop-ups. So yeah. the reason I'm asking you and I'm pushing you on this is because I'm always, like, Founders are interesting in the way of like, there's two sides of them. There's the one side of you recognize you need money and you, you're putting things in place to do that. And then there's the other side of how much money do I need? And that is always a reflection of, of them, actually. It's a reflection of where you think you are in your business. It actually mm. has very little to do with the trailer or with your operations. And it's like this like deeply personal question. You know, I and just it's, thought it's hard. I just thought, okay, so do you remember at the very beginning when we were like totaling up everything and every time we would have to like increase the number <laughs> a little bit? <laughs> like, so when we were just like really yeah. calculating the cost of like, okay, if we're doing this trailer and if this is the way it's going and these are what the monthly expenses would look like and just getting those rough numbers, every time it was like, okay, so I guess we'll add a little more to it then. And then it was like, okay, what would a year look like if we had everything covered? And so that was something I think that both of us had to get comfortable with mm -hmm. because it was like, this is a big number, but then it's like, but then it's also not when yeah. you look at all of the things it's covering. Yeah. So that just made me think, like we yeah. were just like, all right, and then we could just round up a little. And then <laughs> <laughs> you know what else we went through? Th through this process, there was just how we structured it. It's like, first, are we going to be a nonprofit? Because everyone thinks that we should be a nonprofit because of... Do, Who, who's know, everyone? Do, most people, people assume, assume we're, we're a nonprofit. nonprofit. And the other thing is... I wonder farmer, why. Why do you well, think that one, is? Farmers markets are... Are farms No, nonprofit? not farms, not necessarily. No. Wait, wait. So every farmers market you're saying is a nonprofit? To be a, a certified farmer's market, you either have to be a nonprofit, an actual farmer, or a government entity. God, I had no idea. Could you like, uh, so my entrepreneur head goes, okay, forget that. Let me go left and make myself something similar to a farmer's market. That's but what we a, did. Well, we did. created this <laughs> so entire. So a market. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, te cool. so technically we are not a farmer's market. So you can't okay. legally call yourselves a we, farmer's market? We Is call that ourselves the... pop-ups. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we are a prosperity market. And we're a farmer's market because we're a platform right. for farmer's markets. But right. we are not on paper. You're not for prosperity. You're for prosperity. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why. And that's exactly why we're for profit. We, we chose what we chose because. OK, so you, you chose know, to be for, for we profit. chose yes. to be for profit and we created our structure. Initially, I didn't want to crowdfund. I don't know why there was a big resistance. And I thought, like, we'll just get investors. I was just disillusioned. We'll get investors. It'll be super easy. Yeah. But in trying to go that route, people are like, oh, that's cute. Like, it's a nice little lifestyle brand. And they don't see the, the actual picture. value. That's a real thing, by the way. We talk to a lot of entrepreneurs all the time. And it's always a function of, it's almost like a self-worth question is really what it is. It's what do they think their self-worth is in their head? And then they make products to mirror that. It's really interesting. And so when they're focused on like one, I've been there. Like for me, I had a, a one product company. It was my first company. So my self-worth at the time was that one product. It was, I wasn't thinking big enough. Second company, a little more comfortable, you know, still wasn't thinking big enough. And so every day, like at some point of my day, I'll always ask myself, 
am I thinking big enough today? Yeah, yeah it's, it's like, um, it doesn't feel good to look back on that mirror. But at the same time, it's like when we talk to entrepreneurs, we know exactly how big they're thinking based on the things they're telling us. And it's this also like, oh, okay, I see where they think they are. Even though I think, like for you guys, I think you guys are like amazing. And I think what you guys could do is like massive. I've seen you guys evolve in some way in the last, like, since we met. I've seen the ideas get bigger at a really fast clip compared to most entrepreneurs. Sometimes I think, like, I can speak for myself in saying, like, sometimes there's a separation of like, oh, crap, this is moving. We're going, like, this is happening quick. Like, yeah. the the things we come up with, the way it's happening, the responses that people give, like, it's like, oh, this is going. Yeah, it takes the momentum. And so just to give people, like, real a real example of this, so when we met, I put you guys in touch with the Sola, Sola team that was building the Beehive over at what used to be the Goodyear track, and the missions aligned, and next thing you know, you guys were having an event with them. Mm-hmm. And so I see that, and I go, oh, look, this is introduction that led to something real. Right. But it's not something, anything I did. It's everything you guys did. And so I was like, oh, these people are legit. Like you guys are legit. That gives you a lot of credibility. That was our last in-person market of the year. And it was like. How long ago was that? This was October. It was everything. Like the location was amazing. We had, was it the most vendors that we've ever had? Other than Juneteenth, I think so. Okay. Well, we, we had a lot of vendors. We had new partners. We had like a stage. This was the first time we had live performances. We had a kids area. We had a beer garden. I mean, this we really made this one a special one. Yeah. Did that open or expand your mind in terms of what you saw Prosperity Market could be? Or was that in line with what you always knew Prosperity Market could be? I think now it's in line. Okay. Like from the beginning when we didn't know we would need to create traction for ourselves for these pop-up events, no. But like after the first couple of markets, it was like, oh, no, like we're going to make this a thing. So our markets are a vibe. Like we have DJs, we do like people, people come and they like stay for a long time. They don't just shop. It's like a whole experience. It's like their daily, their event for the day. So it was really cool to be able to just expand it in that way because we had the space, like the beehive is amazing. So it was almost like we don't have to scale back our thoughts of what we want to do because it's set up to be able to do anything. So would you say that space is one of the larger barriers to achieving your full potential or or maximizing each event? Absolutely. It's a big barrier. Um, I finally feel like we're in a place where we're getting ahead, like planning. for. I'm so excited for next year because it's like we can plan out Q1. Like I'm just really excited about that because this past year, it's been just month to month. It's literally been like, okay, we just finished this market. Okay, the next market. And it's hard to run a business that way. Um, Somebody told me that you're building two businesses, the one that you're in right now and the one five years from now. And that's exactly what it felt like. But it's just it wasn't it's not feasible. Right. But now you feel like the business that you're running right now is it seems like it's running under its own steam. And then that enables you to focus on the business that you're trying to build five years from now. Running under its own steam. We're definitely very much still powering it because it's just the two of us. But we have a grasp of what it takes. Like, you know, we've done it enough times now that it's like, okay, we know what these steps are. So now we can actually plan forward. Mm -hmm. And people have seen us do it enough that like, now we can have conversations and be like, oh, because we did this and we did this. So it's not like, what are you trying to do in my space right now? (laughs) And then going back to locations, we were literally there. There was our second market. We got that location. We had already started advertising because we had the date and we're like, oh, crap. We, we didn't have the location on the on our flyers because we didn't have a location. What we had in mind had fallen through. That's the barrier that locations are mm-hmm. like. So now we're able to get a head start on that. So that's and we have some places that we can go back to yeah. as of right now. All of this past year, with the exception of being in Inglewood twice, we haven't done a location twice yet. So there are places that already are like, well, when can you come back? And those kinds of things. And uh, so it's it is it's cool because we have new places to check out, places that we can come back to. And we have enough of a handle on it that every moment is not like, okay, what's the next thing we have to do? Was there ever a location that surprised you in terms of? community uh, support or just the number of people showing up or whatever it may have been? Like, was there anything that you learned from showing up to a location that you hadn't expected? 
My first thought to that question is, it's not about actually our physical location, but for last month, we only did our virtual market, which also that's something to talk about. It's <laughs> <laughs> my favorite. Hold on. Let's but, start with that first. Oh, like, <laughs> so Nick, she said virtual market, right? <laughs> and in my head, I'm what did thinking- you, What did you think? I'm thinking an online store. Yeah. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. How does it work? Just run me through the whole thing. So you go. You so go to I go a website, on a website and yeah. I'm like, I want to buy some produce. Okay. And do you see I, pictures of the produce? Yes. Okay. And then. Yeah. And then I I scroll down. I'm like, oh, I want to buy some iceberg lettuce. I want like two heads of iceberg lettuce. Okay. I, I scroll. I, you like lettuce? Whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, then, and then what? Happens? I'm making a salad. Yeah. And then and then I go to my cart and I check out and then it gets shipped it in my ships. mind. Yeah. Okay. Is that more or less it's what close. it is yeah, okay it's close. all right so how was i wrong <laughs> we don't ship okay. so for us we do it in a line with our monthly pop-up market so the virtual market is on a friday the in-person's on a saturday and then on sunday we do free produce giveaways that's why people think we're a nonprofit too so for the virtual market we have um, contactless pickup so you shop friday you pick up on saturday and we have you can pick up at our market and then we have like satellite pickup locations around the city so if you, you know, if we're in Inglewood, but you live in West Hollywood, well, you can pick up in West Hollywood because we have a pickup location. Mm -hmm. And what surprised me for this last market that was virtual only, we opened it up to West Hollywood and North Hollywood, which is the first time we've done that. And we were also in Inglewood, Lamert Park and Mid City, but those are locations that we've been to before. We had a, like West Hollywood was our biggest response. And North Hollywood was our second. And it's something that we wanted to do, but this was the perfect opportunity to do it. And we had a really great response. So not only does it say, hey, continue doing this, yeah. but it also lets us know like where some of the people that have been showing up to our markets have been traveling from. So that was really cool because there are there are a significant amount of people who come to every market that we so see. So you're seeing repeat customers. Oh, then. 100%. Okay. Yeah. And just to your point when you said like one of the locations that like surprised us, for me, one, every location really is different. And so we have to learn like how to like reach out and market and stuff like that. But I would say the location that surprised me the most was Malibu. Yeah. And some of that was because, so they reached out to us. This was our third market, third or fourth, they reached out to us, but they also were doing marketing on their end because we're not in Malibu. So nobody in Malibu knew us at all. And so they were doing marketing on their end, like reaching out, and it was a huge turnout. People were excited about it. And people, they're like, are you guys doing this again? Is this gonna be a regular thing? So many people showed up. And like it was, it was huge. So that for me was like surprising. The news came out. The, yeah, the, the <laughs> ABC. Yeah, it was a whole thing. And so not like, oh, of course Malibu, like they know farmers market. So in that respect, it but just how excited people were and how many people came out was really surprising. Um, even the vendors were surprised, and there were a couple of vendors that were like, Malibu's kind of far. I don't know if I want to go. All the and yeah, then they were like, oh, okay, Malibu. we do that again <laughs> for sure. So that was one of my most like surprising markets. And will you guys just replicate that? Like for next year, will you just double down and do one at every single location? And so you have like 10 markets at a time. What do you guys view as like your scaling? Scaling for us, like when we have the trailer, it'll be easier to do that because then we can operate daily and it's not just a monthly event okay. or even just a Saturday so event. So you want to be like an everyday yes. the trailer, at a certain yes. location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. And then for like the expansive that'll be less frequently. So we still might keep it to once a month and rotate it. Yeah, the, the big in yeah. person with all the vendors. But when we have the trailer, that's going to be a regular. That sets every, you free. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have a second trailer and a third trailer and, and build that way each neighborhood just at this point has a trailer. Yeah, because the point is, you know, really to support local growers and food producers and also the economy that way so it's really like once we do scale once we do have uh prosperity market trailers all over the country you know the we're country. both from yeah of course of course <laughs> but you're like we're both from maryland so it's like you know so is nick yeah what? hey look at that we're in maryland <laughs> at all the old days <laughs> all the old i mean days. it's coursing through our blood right now exactly. yeah. i'm from baltimore no way yeah I, so i grew up uh, in only Montgomery County. Yeah. Right out. Yeah. In between Baltimore and DC. There was an amazing vintage and thrift store that I used to go to that was out that way. It was really? so good. 
I can't remember the name of it right now. Make but it's so know. good. I, he's not a fan. I, I <laughs> get my own vintage. <laughs> he makes his vintage. Yeah. It's right. fine. <laughs> so yeah, like we're gonna have prosperity market trailers everywhere, and you know the local growing food producers in one area and also the local ecosystem and local economy in Maryland doesn't look like it is in LA, Mm -hmm. you know, different things seasonally, different producers, just, you know, and, and really it's supporting each neighborhood and each area's local ecosystem and local agriculture system that way. Never a building? Yes. (laughs) Also, also building. The farmer's market thing in Houston is pretty dope. Also I can totally see you guys doing that. We, well, we have I could just see trip. Prosperity Market exactly. like on the top of it. And it's like a vibe. Like it's so well done and it's all outdoor. Yeah. It's super amazing. That sounds amazing. And they have like top tier chefs. Like they'll have like Michelin star chefs. And so it's got the high and low. If you want that, it's there. And if you just want someone making something really good at like, you know, whatever little thing they have, it's there too. Sounds like you're reading our notes. Is that it? <laughs> That's part of it. That's the vision? That's part of it. When you guys do square footage maps, how, like how big does it need to be? For the building? Even what you're doing now, like how much space, or is it a parking lot? Like what, what size is what you guys are, your current markets? <laughs> it is varied very greatly. Each Because the trailer is small, is so right? Different. I mean, it's not well, small. No, the but trailer it's, is big. But it's not like, like, it's not like a football field. Oh, no. The trailer is not mm-hmm. like a football field. Right. But like the That'd pop-ups. Tough to tow. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pop-ups vary in size based on the space. Yeah. Okay. Give me a sense of like how big or how small that they've they've varied. Well, we've gone anywhere from like fifteen vendors in ten by ten spaces okay. to thirty. Um, thirty, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. Depending on who's available, depending on the space mm-hmm. that we're working with. So the bigger the parking lot, the more the more we leeway do. you have yeah. to yeah. work with, and music, yeah. and then all that kind of stuff. Absolutely, because we can't not have the the vibe. Yeah, it's got to right. be a vibe. You right, know? the vibe. Are there any? locations in LA that are kind of like uh, in your mind or a reach or, or someday you'd like to host an event here like let's say the parking lot of the SoFi Center when you know right before the World Cup and the Olympics were in town <laughs> or the SoFi Center or that's, inside the SoFi Center <laughs> yeah. that is literally just like that's on my board yeah. mm-hmm. I, we need to have a prosperity market in there and it could even just be the same I might be saying too much for this podcast like <laughs> that's they the point might of the podcast. Still... <laughs> let's go <laughs> no I just mean like, You're not I, saying I'm, enough. I'm saying ideas that like we should just work on privately but <laughs> <laughs> but you say I'm here and then there's that ago. exterior pressure it's like now everyone expects a prosperity market at the SoFi Center yeah. well, you want to make sure th- people yeah. are thinking big right that's really it right. yeah like I, I want it I want to be in airports like I want mm. prosperity market and it could be it could be our rotating chef model or maybe it could be like the produce or both or but airports SoFi all of and that and this was something like the airport thing was a conversation early and I think one of why the, airports I, that was because i was in the airport yeah. and i was like aha <laughs> but so like, what do you see that looking like because you know i've never seen anything like a, a market yeah, in an airport garbage right exactly it's so all just garbage okay. and that we don't want it to be all just garbage and the thing is because we have so many kind of pieces to what we're doing we could take any of those pieces and kind of tailor it for specific locations so that it's not all just garbage <laughs> So really what terminal at LAX are we talking about? <laughs> I usually Which fly airline American. do you fly? <laughs> yeah, I was just saying, yeah. Oh, no. So five. What's a merit? Five? five? Four and five, yeah. Okay. But Don't I'm not going to lie, now. whatever number Southwest is gets a lot of traffic. So we got to be in the Southwest <laughs> number one, terminal. Terminal number one. Yeah. It is number one. Yeah. You know. You I, know I, your I've been in LAX a couple times. You, you know yeah. your... Anything that you guys want to tease? Yeah, we have um, we have holiday boxes, curated Prosperity Market holiday boxes that you can get on our website. And they have um, just like our favorites, our best sellers and our favorites from all of our vendors and nice little giftable boxes. How much are they? Boxes. They range from uh, 45 to, to 55. 55. And there's produce box, snack box, flavor box with like sauces and seasonings, and then self-care box. This could be a good, a good like corporate gift. Yeah. Absolutely. Are you, well, are you offering nationwide shipping as well? Right no. now we're not shipping. Okay. Um, or it's we a should ship yeah. is what you're saying. Just to Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> just to Maryland. Yeah. Just, just from Montgomery <laughs> County. That's, Please. Just ship between LA and Maryland only. Right. Well, I'm going home for the holidays, so I could just 
tell me what you need. Same. Yeah. <laughs> Just fly with it. Right. Yeah. So we will have um, pickup locations. And like you said, for corporate gifting, yeah. we are having conversations and also open to companies and organizations that want to do gifting. And we will make sure it's delivered to you. And that goes back to the virtual market, too. If organizations, companies want to shop the virtual market, we can deliver it to your office. Yeah. So you, I'll put an order, order in. in. I'll put a couple orders in. Yay. Maybe 10. Great. We love that. You won't get one. <laughs> stop, stop, please. You're not even home for the holidays. I mean, it, what's home? <laughs> <laughs> he's That's he's a not great home, idea. but That's he's really going cool. home. You know. Tell me about the, so what's the self-care box? What's in that? Would you like to? <laughs> My my favorite. Your personal favorite. <laughs> so sad. Um, so this we, is directly curated by you then. We, all of it is. Every okay. single thing the market we thoughtfully itself, put together. The vendors, like all, just in general, we have curated Can I this. guess? Let me guess. Go ahead. Let me try okay. this. <laughs> all right, look, some bath salts. Not a, salts. A candle. Yes. Definitely a candle. A loofah. That's an add-on. That's an option. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Wait a um, <laughs> moisturizer. Yeah, body yeah. butter. Slippers? <laughs> no, a and, rope? And, 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 and artisan soaps. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Information. Is your e-commerce side going up in business? Like, do you see, like, the virtual market concept, is that picking up? Like, how do you, what's it's catching the... catching on. It's, yeah. been, it's been a big experiment. Yeah. Um, and I think November was great because since we didn't have a in-person market, people, if you want, you know, the vendors that you've known to grow in love, if you still want their products you have to go on the website so i think that pushed people who would usually come in person so i think moving forward we'll continue to see that we also have different vendors online like there are some vendors who aren't available in person but they can sell online so there's like new products you should do both and it's one of those things where we've really gotten to see it is how many points of contact before someone is willing to like check something out how many is it Marketing, it's seven to nine. But you know what? That was our our 10th virtual market. And that was actually the time that we saw a lot of our regulars in person shop online. Yeah. So that holds true. Yeah. So it really is, you know, us sharing about it, us looking at creative ways to grow it. Because we started from scratch. It was like, oh, hey, come buy your groceries online with yeah. us. Yeah. You know, and just and people are like, what do you mean? Yeah. But once people started seeing the market experience, then they were also more willing to be like, okay, now I'll check out online. Or once we had done it, had a few markets under our belt, people are like, okay, I can check this out. Well, tell people where they can find you. We are, our website is prosperitymarketla.com and we're on Instagram, prosperity.market. And we're working on Twitter so you can follow us. <laughs> Twitter, okay. Right. We're working on it at prosperity. Why, why Twitter? M-R-K-T, <laughs> because why not? M-R-K-T. I'm just curious. All the touch points. Yeah, I get you. TikTok? Not TikTok. Not, Not yet. TikTok. Not yet? We oh, have come a... on. Rah, rah, rah. Oh, yeah. I mean, all the, all the channels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our podcast isn't all the channels. I, I just personally don't know how to use Twitter yet. It's like, uh, I did at the beginning when I was in tech, because it's like a lot of people in tech, there's like a real e echo chamber. Mm -hmm. But It's a I, bubble. Now I like sure. never use it. I start like personally started very early and then like stopped. Tapered off. Yeah. Same. And then, but I mean... There are people who have a lot of things to say about a lot of the areas that we're doing something about and that we're involved in, you know, not just economically, but in terms of farming, in terms of food, in terms That's of true. access. And So you yeah. can engage with them. You, you meet yeah. them where they are and then you can engage. Yeah. Okay. And so we'll. You know, we're working on that. Yeah. We're also going to have a YouTube pretty soon. Oh, that's there smart. You go. Yeah, there we you are. Go. What are yeah. you going to highlight on your YouTube? Our process and kind of like just what this is like for us that's what's building up. this and growing this. That's great. So are you hiring a team? Who's going to create the content? We're putting when together you say a team. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to collaborate. If you, you just bring on partners. loosely yeah. use that yeah. H word. Yeah. <laughs> We're curating a team, much like we do our market. There you go. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, yeah, Thank guys. you both. Thanks Just for, your story. Thank you for having us. Yay. Thank you.